These grade one students are struggling with a simple case of a very complex problem. The problem comes from 1917 and it remains an unsolved problem of mathematics. But it's a fantastic way to introduce your grade one students to patterns. I'm going to explain this problem on a larger grid than we're going to give the grade one students. On this 10 by 10 grid, you have to place 20 skyscrapers so that no three of them lie on the same line. Here's my first attempt. I have failed miserably. First of all, I don't have 20 skyscrapers on there. And secondly, I've got three in a line here, and three in a line here, and three in a line here. I've got four in a line on that one. So I failed miserably. You can only have a maximum of two skyscrapers on any line. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Here's one solution, another solution, and my favorite solution, this very symmetric one. This is far beyond a grade one student's ability to discover, but you may want to show these to your students a week after they tackle the grade one problem, and that is a four by four grid. Here, they have to place eight skyscrapers onto this grid so that no three of them are on the same line. This is a tough problem for grade one students, but most groups will discover at least one solution within 15 minutes, and many groups are going to discover more than one solution. Whenever you're wandering around the room, you can help students by pointing out whenever they have made a mistake and have three in a row. You can do this verbally, or you can just do it with your hand moving across the line that has three in a row. One, two, three. One, two, three. No. One, two, three. No. One, two, three. No. Soon, students are going to be finding their own solutions. And let's just go through those solutions now, just so you know what to expect. The most common solution is this one here. Take a moment and confirm to yourself that there are no three skyscrapers that lie in a straight line. Let's look at a second solution. This one tends to be discovered a little bit less often than the first one. And you should now take a moment and confirm that it is a correct solution. That there's no three in a line here. This third solution is the one discovered least often. Again, confirm that it is a solution. The last of these solutions looks kind of like a stop sign. Whenever a group discovers a solution, you just challenge them to find a new solution. I've yet to find a group of two students who manages to discover all four solutions in a class. There will be student groups who look around and find other people's solutions and copy them onto their own sheet of paper. Instead of tackling this by trying to suppress that behavior, the way I deal with it is I go up to any group who have solved a problem I just look at their sheet of paper, I give them a low-key response, and then I say, okay, find another solution. What that does is it puts the onus on them to come up with their own internal reward system for discovering solutions, rather than relying on me. Yeah, you got it. Good. Find another solution. Find another solution. There's a time and a place for liberal praise, and some students really do need an external validation of their work. But experiment with not giving it. Yes, got it. Good for you. Okay. Was it hard to find? It was very hard. Yeah. Okay, find another solution. After your students have grappled with this problem and found some solutions, it's time to gather them together for a classroom discussion. 
One way to make these group discussions interesting is to get the students to name their different discoveries. For example, this might become a fish, and this pattern might become a staircase, and this pattern might become a strange looking butterfly, and the stop sign might become a stop sign. Another direction that you can go with your classroom discussions is looking at mirror symmetry and rotational symmetry. So we've before said that there were four solutions, but is that really true? Well, we could take the fish and we could rotate it to create a new solution and we could rotate it again and create another new solution and again for four new solutions. Is that right? Well, it's a matter of opinion. Your students might decide that those are all one solution or they might decide that those are four different solutions. The same for the staircase. We could take the staircase and we can rotate it to create a different solution, rotate it again to create another different solution, rotate it a third time to create another solution. Is this correct? No, look at that. The second and fourth are the same and the first and the third are the same. So those are not four different solutions for sure. So we can definitely get rid of the lower two. But we can flip this image to create another image that definitely looks different from the other two and we can rotate that to create another image that is again different. So are we dealing here with four different solutions or just one solution? For the butterfly we can again suggest that there's four different solutions that we can rotate it, rotate it again, rotate it again and that each one of these four different rotations creates a different solution. Is that right? Well, hopefully now your students will say, well, wait a second, the first and the third are the same, and the second and the fourth are the same, so we can get rid of those bottom two images. Boom. And they might suggest to flip it over. That produces two different ones. Is that right? No, because again, they're the same as the ones on the left. So we can get rid of those two. What about the stop sign? Well, the stop sign, we can rotate it for a different solution, rotate it again for a different solution, rotate it again for a different solution. And hopefully here your kids are going to be going crazy. They're going to be saying, no, 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 those are all the same. And of course they are. So we, we don't have four different solutions here. We just have one. Your students can try flipping it, but they're still going to end up with something that looks distinctly similar to the first solution. So how many solutions do we have? Well, depending on your point of view, depending on what your children decide, you either have four different solutions or you've got 11 different solutions. A rich argument to have in your classroom. One of the things that you have to be careful of is choosing the size of your manipulatives. If you choose them too big like this, then the students might get confused and draw a line in their minds like this and say, well, this line is touching four skyscrapers, so this can't be a correct solution. But of course, it should only be touching two skyscrapers, that line. So to avoid that confusion, choose your manipulatives to be small with respect to the grid. The unsolved problem of mathematics is to figure out how many skyscrapers you can cram into a really big city like this one. The person responsible for popularizing this problem was Henry Dudney, the great English puzzle master from the first part of the 20th century. Enjoy it.